as I thought it should be. I often visualize myself as existing on a moonbeam in a utopian state for eternity. I have always been a baby in an adult body. I want what I want, when I want it. Finally, in Atlanta, Georgia, I found a program of Narcotics Anonymous. Psychiatry was not helping. Prescribed medication did nothing but make me want more. When I was doing amphetamine, the doctor would put me on tranquilizers to calm me down, and when I was doing down, I was put on antidepressants to help stabilize my mood swings and depression. At one point, I remember being told, just face it, you will never be able to live without being on some kind of medication. Depression eventually became my normal state of mind and spirit. Suicide remained my dominating thought. My favorite pastimes were hanging over an interstate overpass or seeing how close I could get to moving trains. My social life was non-existent, and my zest for life was so low I even lost the energy it took to get more drugs. My bottom had arrived and somehow I was still alive. My therapist at this point was a lady who understood the disease of addiction. She refused to continue seeing me if I would not attend a Narcotics Anonymous meeting. I went to a few meetings and told her that there was no way the program could work for me. When she wouldn't buy that excuse, I told her that I thought the people were using because there was no way in my mind that people could look and sound so happy, and have so much freedom, without being loaded. I remember sitting in a survivor's meeting one night and asking the guy next to me, are these people for real or are they all loaded? He looked at me rather emphatically, and replied, they are for real. Then there was the higher power concept. For me, having had two years of Bible college, and a lot of theology in my head, I confused spirituality with religion. This was one of my biggest obstacles in developing conscious contact with a power greater than myself. My struggle became Alien 135. Evident when at a meeting where a higher power was the topic, I told them, I don't believe in a power greater than myself, and I am sick of hearing this topic discussed. After about two minutes of silence, the guy across the room stood up, walked over to me, and whispered in my ear, I know where you're coming from, and I want to tell you that this group of people is a power greater than you. That was the foundation for my concept of a higher power. Today I choose to call my higher power God, yet there are many times today when the group is moved. God, as I understand him today, is a gentle, loving, and understanding spirit. I believe today that my higher power kept me alive long enough to find the fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous. I am grateful to be alive. The day I surrendered to the fact that I was powerless over my addiction and enormous ways was removed from me. The addiction said, one of the hardest things that I have encountered is change. I have had to change my playground from playmates. For me, that was one of the easier areas of change. It was true on day one, and remains so today, essential for ongoing recovery. What has been hardest is changing attitudes, ideas, patterns, and reactions. When I encounter people today who don't agree with me, I need to try and respond to them in a spirit of love. This is quite a change from ignoring them as I did in the past. As a result of working my
because nothing I did mean to get me to that place called happiness. I was brought up in a religious atmosphere, but I never seemed to be able to grasp what it all meant. I didn't understand how God could love me one minute but the next strike me down to hell. This understanding of mine sent me to rebel against all that I was taught to be sinful. I was determined to prove that if I dance, smoke, cut my hair, or war pants, I will not go to hell. I began to do all these sins in junior high school and ended up pregnant at 15. I did not want to get married and be a housewife. My first reaction was to have my baby and raise it myself, but that didn't go off very well, so I got married and had my child at 16. Again, I didn't want to take the responsibility of my action, so I went into the marriage bitter, but determined to make it work. My husband and I were two kids playing house. We began going out to clubs, drinking and living it up. I thought at this time that I had found it. This was the life. Right before our third wedding anniversary, my husband was shot and killed at one of those live it up night clubs. Well, needless to say, I really had a good excuse now. I now had another reason to top out on this big, bad world. I honestly felt that mean God in the clouds. 137. 138 Narcotics Anonymous. Was really paying me back for all the sins I had committed. I hated him. I'd lay awake many a night in agony wondering if God and my husband could see and hear the pain of loneliness I felt. I never got an answer. After my husband's death, his best friend and I began spending time together crying and laughing at memories of the past. Not too long after this I was introduced to acid. My first trip was spent on the floor with me crying and wishing my old man hadn't died on me. The bad trip didn't seem to bother me, because somewhere in my mind I knew I had found something new, a new world. Maybe it was happiness. I was constantly searching for relief from the pain and about this time another man came along, except he was different because he had cats. This man saw a scared little girl in agony and wanted to buy the herd away. Well, I tell you, it didn't take me very long at all to grab onto that and hold on till I used him up completely. With access to so much cash, it was just a matter of time before I was burned out on the pills I was taking, but the high just wasn't the same. Again, I began a search for escape from myself and I found it, the needle. My first shot was ecstasy. The feeling that ran through my body and veins when I got off was one of contentment and exhilaration. I had never dreamed anything could feel so good. During this time of discovering the new high, I was trying to keep two men happy. My sugar daddy was constantly forking out cash and I was forking out lies. My old man and I really thought we were something, we had all that cash to buy all the bills we needed or wanted. But there was something wrong that I couldn't quite grasp. I was slowly running out of whatever it took for me to lead a double life. For about a year I shot dope for fun. I thought, if it feels good, do it. It wasn't very long before the needle had taken full control of me, I was no longer in command. This dependency led me to be very careless, and the next thing I knew I was busted twice in a period of a few months. I'll never forget the feeling that I had as I was being photographed and fingerprinted. All I wanted to do was go back and fix drugs. 
My mind and body were so screwed up I wasn't even aware that I had a daughter at home waiting for me. Someone told me that if I went to a hospital and kicked, I could probably be the case. So that's exactly what I went for. I knew I had been doing too much dope, but I thought I just needed rest. I ended up having my friends bring me dope through windows, and in the meantime proceeded to drive my family crazy. My husband was sentenced and I got two. A little girl grows up 139. Years probation. That really did it. Again God had taken away my reason for living. Before my husband left, I made promises that I would be faithful, save money that my sugar daddy gave me, and only shoot dope occasionally. I was only able to keep one, and that was to be faithful. I literally stayed in my bedroom and bathroom for two years, waiting for the day my husband would come home and make me happy again. But there was a problem. The needle slowly became my friend, lover and my reason for living. I lost the glimpse of self-respect that I had left. I spent hours in the bathroom fixing and crying because a syringe owned me now. There was nothing that I could do. As a result of shooting dope, I began to miss a lot and those misses turned into infected sores from my head to my toes. I spent a lot of time telling my daughter and parents that those sores on me were just spoiled. I didn't realize how sick I had become. I lost everything. I was a zombie with no feelings for anyone or anything except my rush. I remember thinking that when my husband came home I could quit and everything would be alright. It wasn't. I tried staying clean for a while, I worked in a furniture store my father had started for us, but nothing worked. Before long I was at it again and by this time I was completely out of control. There were no veins left, so I had to go in about one minus half an inch to find one and I nearly lost my veins for good. All this time I was trying to be a mother, wife, and girlfriend. I dressed myself up for a day put on my mask and perform my duties, but it never did work. I had no motivation to help myself. During the worst time of my addiction, my thoughts were never suicidal. I just wanted to sleep till it all went away. My old ideas told me it was a sin to take my own life. I couldn't really see that I was slowly doing just that. As deep as I was into my habits, it wasn't long before I was selling everything. I had run out of lies to tell my money man, so next went my house, cars and jewelry. I didn't care, I had to have my dope. There were people reaching out to me with all they had, but all I could do was shoot more dope. When someone tried to get close to this scared little girl, I didn't have any idea how to respond. I didn't have the strength to get out of it at all. It wasn't long, till I got busted again. This time it was different. It was the end for me. I had never been one to assist cops in anything but now the running was over and I knew it. I told them exactly what I had done and I didn't really care what the consequences were, I just wanted out. I was picked up at a drugstore and taken to jail. I was so messed up that nothing mattered, nothing. 140 Narcotics Anonymous I was unable to walk, both my legs were so bent from infection that I couldn't straighten them out. I was carried by the nurses before the judge to have my bond set. As foggy headed as I was, I'll never forget the voices of disgust and pity as I was carried into the courtroom. 
something inside my sick mind and heart told me it was finally all over. I suddenly realized how close I was to prison or even death. Without my knowledge, my father had found a lawyer to get me out. The nurses informed me that I was on my way to a hospital, police escort and all. Before I left the jail my lawyer arrived. He came in, introduced himself, and then proceeded to tell me the most frightening words I'd ever heard, it's time for you to grow up. He told me the only reason he was taking my case was because he hated to see a grown man cry, and my father had sat in his office and cried like a baby, pleading with him to please help his little girl this last time. He informed me there would be no more calling my parents, brothers, sisters or sugar daddy for help. I was to stand on my own two feet for once and take the responsibility for my actions. I had never been so scared in my life. The things he told me scared me more than anything, even my arrest and losing my daughter weren't as scary as having to grow up. I didn't know where to begin. I had no idea of how to grow up and no idea of what he really meant except that it had to be done somehow. When I arrived at the hospital, I was informed that there would be no phone calls in and no phone calls out. I couldn't even talk to my parents. I didn't like that too much, but I knew I had better listen for the first time in my life. My lawyer was the only visitor I had for the first few days and he really helped me laugh at myself. I was laying in bed one day, feeling sorry for myself, and counting my scars. I had 22 of them. He looked at me very seriously and said, I know what we'll do. We'll paint you green and play dot to dot. I had never in my serious, condemning mind found that I could ever laugh at myself in such a forgiving way. Before, if I laughed at me, I was judging me for being such a failure at life. Now there seemed to be some relief and hope, nothing was that bad anymore. My next trip was to a treatment center, I was determined to make it work this time. I spent a lot of time preparing myself to go to prison because there just didn't seem to be a way out of it. My lawyer told me there would have to be a miracle somewhere, because I had really gone my limit. I knew this, people just didn't get out of three narcotics arrests, including fraud, without ratting and without going to jail. The song, Why Me Lord? A little girl grows up 141. Into my head while I was there in a stage. Every time I laid down to go to sleep it was there. I had begun to know what gratitude was. My prayers were limited to, help me. I didn't know what I was really praying to, but I had to pray anyway. I couldn't carry the burden alone anymore. The people around me were telling me that I had to believe in something bigger and greater than me or I would die. I could look in their eyes and see that they must be telling the truth, because something was there and I wanted it. For the first time I was told I could have my own God who would love and understand me. I could have a God that no one else had if I chose. What a relief this was to me. I no longer had certain rules and regulations to belong somewhere. My God and I could make up our own. Now I was beginning to know what faith was and I had taken the first three steps in my life. My heart told me now that whatever happened in my life would be God's will and that my worries could be taken away if I just prayed and believed. It all seemed so simple to do, but my will just wasn't ready to give up. 
I kept telling myself, you've made a decision, stick with it for once and see what happens. The words in the third step, made a decision, scared me because I didn't know what decision meant. I had never decided on anything, I had just reacted. To the best of my ability, I stayed with the third step throughout my time at the treatment center. My next trip was to a halfway house in Birmingham. My counselor recommended that I go, so I could get some time behind me and see what it was really like to be clean for more than 30 days. When she told me the name of the place, I had second thoughts. I thought there would be a bunch of sisters in robes greeting me. I couldn't conceive of living with 18 women under one roof for too long, but I knew I had to go. To my surprise, I was greeted by several lovely women who were not nuns, but alcoholics. I knew I had come to a place of love, acceptance and understanding beyond my comprehension. They told me everything was going to be all right, and I believed them with all my heart. My stay there began with mixed emotions. I often wanted to leave, yet, my little girl and take off somewhere to get away from all the pain of reality. I also read a great deal about the fourth step and knew it was time to take a fourth step in my life. I spent numerous hours writing about what had happened in my life, the pain I had felt, and the pain I had caused. I wrote about everything. There was a great deal of pain and embarrassment involved, but also an overwhelming feeling of relief. I was finally able to get out all the pain that had been with me all my life. To look at me on a piece. 142 Narcotics Anonymous A paper, and realized how irresponsible I had been, just verified the fact that there would be no more running. The old me was finally beginning to die. I began to see that I really didn't deserve all the punishment I had bestowed upon myself, and that maybe I was worthy of that thing called happiness. I spent several months on the fourth step and when it came time to do the fifth step there was no planning. It was just time to do it.